so wonderful to have so many students here. I'm Christian DuPont. I'm the Burns Librarian, and so, and I have several of my Burns Library colleagues and staff here in the libraries, um, some from our O'Neill Library. Do you welcome? So, um, on behalf of all of us and the Irish Studies Program, welcome to the Burns Visiting Scholar Talk. This is our 43rd Burns Visiting Scholar since 1991. Uh, fall, spring, sometimes it's the whole year we've had a scholar. Um, creative writer coming from Ireland, generally um, to other parts of the world. Uh, our new inaugural uh, chair of Irish studies, Guy Biner, is, was a Burns scholar a couple years ago. We'll remind you that next week uh, is his talk here, again, in this room, same format. Uh, drinks and reception first and then talk afterward. That'll be a lot of fun on that controversial patties in space title. Okay, so we'll remind you of that. I know that's been part of the buzz of the reception. Good. Um, so that's all I want to do is simply to welcome you, okay, because we want to get on to hear Paul Murray, who's been here all semester um, doing writing. Uh, and this is one of the great things that we can do with a, a visiting scholars program like this is to give writers, historians, um, uh, literary scholars, that chance, a kind of sabbatical in the best sense of the word, to come here, do a bit of teaching, but also just to, to be among a community of friends and to have just the space of time um, away from home to do some writing. So Paul has, of course, been working on his new novel. We're gonna hear some bits about that and the, the, uh, the process of, of how to write a novel. So, um, so again, welcome for that. To properly introduce, or improperly, um, some of you read the improper Bostonian, I imagine, right? I'm looking at Joe New and profile, and uh, to have him come up now, uh, first of all, I think to roast me and get me out of the way here, right, so that he can properly or improperly introduce Paul Murray, whom he's known for a very long time and has wonderful things to say, so I will step aside. Would I roast you, Christian? Not at all. Nothing. Not at all. Welcome, everybody. Thanks very, very much, Christian. Uh, perhaps the most disreputable literary festival in Ireland, and there have been many of them, was the short-lived Flat Lake Festival held annually from 2007 to 2011. Known only to the cognoscenti, it took place in a very large field in, unsurprisingly perhaps, County Monaghan. It was the brainchild of novelist Patrick McCabe. And if you know the chaos, the absurdity, the wholesale lunacy of McCabe's The Butcher Boy, You'll guess that this field, big as it was, was insufficient to contain the mayhem that was decreed for this three-day bacchanalia. In the five years it existed before being laid low by insolvency and animosity, McCabe's fame and imagination sought to it that everybody who was anybody in literature and entertainment and the arts made an appearance. Seamus Heaney, Dermot Healy, Anthony Cronin, Paul Durkin, and Enright. Music by Donal Lunny, Shane McGowan. Conceptual art by Dorothy Cross. And the incidental entertainments. Tired, if you were, of the Kilfenora mariachi band <laughs> in tent one. Not up to the karaoke with live sheep accompaniment around the corner. Guests could explore the human zoo. Arty types, on the other hand, might settle into the back seat of the Volkswagen minibus that hosted the International Film Festival. The yurt beside mine that year was inhabited by an Englishman who'd come over on his motorbike, bike and sidecar, which contained his wife Mabel and parrot Ernie, who had been invited to deliver afternoon art classes in tent three. That's Ernie, the parrot, the art instructor. After a brief appearance that Saturday afternoon, the oracular John Banville had only just been reassumed back into heaven when the skies opened and a night of torrential rain began. I was obliged to seek refuge in the bar tent. There was nowhere else to go. And it was there that I first came upon reticent Paul Murray and uh, in the company of the unreticent Kevin Barry, is sharing the bar with, as I remember, a lacrimose Sam Shepard, actor and playwright, that i just read Paul's first novel, An Evening of Long Goodbyes, and knew that it had been shortlisted for the Whitbread First Novel Prize was my excuse to elbow my way into that august, if somewhat wobbly, company. 
I'm very glad that I did. I've gained much from being friends with Paul ever since. And of course, I knew that Paul had just a short while earlier published Skippy Dies. Skippy went on to become a New York Times bestseller, long-listed for the Booker, short-listed for the Costa, a work I was to discover of tragic comic grandeur. It remains unsurpassed for wit and poignancy. And I find an excuse to teach it every single year in one guise or another. The students still devour it greedily. A graduate of Trinity College Dublin and of the creative program at the University of East Anglia, it was no surprise that Paul could write like that. Now that his most recently published novel, The Mark and the Void, went on to become joint winner of the Bollinger Everyman Woodhouse Prize in 2015, and was one of Time Magazine's top 10 fiction books of that year. 2015, the good news is that there's another book on the way. That just a couple of weeks ago, Paul sent off to his UK publishers, Hamish Hamilton, and to his American publishers, Farris, Strauss, and Giro, the final edits of his last seven years of blood, sweat, and I expect the odd tear here and there, Paul. We're very lucky in Boston College and to have Paul here as Byrne Scholar this semester. It's always been a great pleasure to be counted as a friend of his and of his wife Miriam's. It's equally a pleasure to introduce him to you here today. Paul Murray, thanks very, very much, everybody. Hi, everybody. Is this, can you hear me okay with this? Great. Um, I'm, sorry, I'm reading off my laptop. My students have, know the Lenovo. <laughs> it tends to sort of shut down uh, capriciously sometimes. This man, is, can you not hear me? Okay, do you want me to bellow? This is, okay, how's that? It feels a bit sepulchral, yeah? Is that all right? Um, thanks, Joe, for that lovely introduction. That's so kind. I remember vividly um, Sam Shepard at that Flat Lake Festival. He's about seven foot tall, and he's about 100 years old, and he's dressed in like black leather from head to toe. He's with this like very beautiful blonde woman. Um, we thought he was so cool. Uh, before I begin, may I take this opportunity to extend my thanks to uh, Christian, um, the Burns librarian, uh, the Burns family for their largesse in making this fellowship possible. Um, thanks to Guy, the director of the Irish Studies program here at BC, and to all the new friends I've made um, in the last couple of months who've made me feel so welcome here at BC. Uh, it really is, uh, after like many years working on my own, um, on the book, uh, like it's it's just it's very it's just been a joyful experience to be among uh, well-intentioned people. Um, so the title of the lecture today is how to write a novel, um, and the real import of that is you know that in 20 years working as a writer, I've learned the value of, of marketing. Um, but I'm going to start with a confession to those of you who've turned up genuinely expecting me to explain how to write a novel that. To a certain extent, is um, false uh, advertising. Um, I can't tell you how to write a novel. I don't mean that in the way that a magician can't tell you how he did his trick. Um, I would love to be able to tell you that to write a novel, you need just three simple things or direct you to an app. I'd love to be able to sit down myself at my desk to work and know that I was doing it right. But if writing that was was something that could be explained. If there's a set of rules like a recipe that you could just follow step by step and at the end of it you'd have a novel, like writers wouldn't historically have had to drink so much uh, and the body count generally would have been a lot lower. The sad truth, of course, is that writing your novel is something only you can do. Like you meet people along the way who'll help you with this and that. But by and large, it's a path you have to walk alone. Um, not only that, but it's a path to paraphrase roomy that you can't even see until you're walking on it. Um, so I'm sorry. I apologize, it's always the way you should start a lecture, I think. I've brought you here into false pretenses. Um, so this lecture is not going to be about how to write a novel. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna take the confession a stage further. It's not, strictly speaking, gonna be a, a lecture. Um, I'm a novelist. Uh, I've never given a lecture in my life. I really have no business giving lectures. Um, I tried my best to get out of it, but contractually I'm obliged to give you a lecture. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here I am. Um, I've always envied, uh, 
experts to this day when I listen to BBC Radio 4 and I hear the world's foremost authority on like mollusks or whatever it might be. I think how great it would be to, to have that certainty, to, put, to have put in a lifetime's work and reached a position where you know in your little field um, exactly where everything is and what it is and how it works, that when it comes to mollusks, like, you know the score. But, but writers aren't experts. As a writer, you don't know the score. You can't know the score. Not knowing the score is, in a certain sense, the entire point. Um, as a writer, you're trying to get at what it feels like to be alive. And to be alive, more than anything else, is about not knowing. Um, from the micro level to the macro level, from what we're going to have for lunch to when we're going to die, we don't know what's going to happen. Is Putin going to drop a nuclear bomb? Is my neighbor stealing my newspaper? Will I get that promotion? Did that girl smile at me, or was it more of a grimace? Did I do the right thing? Am I a good person? Not knowing is the condition of life, and of course, the greatest mystery of all is ourselves. Because the things that matter most to us can't be explained. Why do we fall in love with the people we fall in love with? Why do we fall out of love with them? Why do we do the work we do? What makes a scientist choose to be a scientist? What made our friend the world-renowned expert? What, in God's name, made him want to spend his entire life studying mollusks? Because when he puts aside all his science and knowledge and work and expertise, um, and let me note that there are over 120,000 species of mollusks, so this guy is not Whistling Dixie. When he looks in the mirror at night and asks himself why, all he can say is, there's just something about mollusks. Um, which is to say that underneath that carefully constructed, ordered, reasonable life lies a passion, a deeply unscientific passion that can't be quantified or explained. And that's the way it is with everything that truly matters to us. There's something about mollusks. There's something about that boy or that girl. There's something about the traffic on this particular street on this particular morning that makes me think I can't do this anymore. At the heart of each of us is a mystery and it freaks us out. We don't want to be in the dark, out of the loop at sea. These are all bad things. We hate not knowing the answers. And so we make our lives as routinized as we can. We become the experts of our own personal domains. Today, more than ever, we quantify anything that can be quantified. We flock to the Silicon Valley gurus, like Google, who do literally have all the answers. And they tell us that emotions are just fluctuations in our brain chemistry. Our actions at any point are predictable with enough information. You are reducible to your grades, your biometrics, a series of pictures on Instagram, whatever it might be. Um, which makes me think there's a famous H.L. Mencken quote, for every thorny and complicated problem, there's a clear and simple solution which is wrong. Um, because information only helps us up to a point, and inevitably the moment comes um, when life or death strips our carefully curated self-images away, when something happens that we simply can't integrate into a rational model, when things stop making sense and we wonder if they ever made sense or if we were just going through the motions. And of course, those are the moments that art is interested in, like books and stories, or about people and the things that matter to them, about searching for something that matters, about realizing that something matters, about coming into conflict over the things that matter. And paradoxically, reading those books and stories which don't pretend to explain or make sense can nevertheless bring us a consolation and peace that information can't. A momentary stay against confusion, that's how Robert Frost defined poetry. In a poem, a story, a novel, though they can't answer the questions, they can pose them in such a way that the confusion is warded away long enough for the reader to regain her balance. It can make the chaos and disorder of life seem somewhat more homely. It can make us feel less alone. It can bring us some measure of peace. So you can see why for a writer of all people it's important not to allow yourself to believe that you've figured it out. You need to feel what your characters feel. You need to understand what your characters feel. That's not the same as diagnosing them. If you think you're an expert in human nature, and you know what your characters will do at every point because of your mastery of psychology and the human heart, you're going down a dangerous path. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that the more sure you are of what you're doing as you set about your novelistic work, the further you are away from writing a good book. That is to say, a novel that embodies some kind of truth, a novel with the integrity to give us that momentary state. Also, your characters hate you. Um, Zen monks have a concept of beginner's mind. When you sit down to meditate, you have to leave all your expertise behind you because it's not going to get you where you want to go. And it's the same in writing. Every time you sit down with the empty page, you have to think of yourself as a beginner, leaving all of your preconceptions behind you, letting the story take you where it wants to go. <coughs> Clever you, knowledgeable you, that is not the you that the reader wants to hear from. The reader does not want to listen to your op-ed or your Burns le lecture or your listicle of top 10 wise insights. They do not want to be informed. 
They want to be taken somewhere, and that can't happen unless you've let yourself be taken somewhere too. And in order to do that, the first thing you need to do is abandon any idea you know where you're going. One of my favorite writers, um, the 16th century French philosopher Michel de Montaigne, used to wear a medallion around his neck inscribed with the words, Cossetia, which means, what do I know? And imagine how different the world would be if every blowhard who hoved up onto the TV was wearing a medallion saying, what do I know? If you look at the election results today, how much stress and anxiety could we have been spared uh, if the pollsters just said, we don't really know, we don't, we don't really have a clue what any of this means. We're probably wrong. Montaigne said, I will say anything to you by way of conversation, and I will say nothing to you by way of counsel. He understood there's no certainties in life, not really. But he also understood that sometimes a conversation is enough, a story, a companionable voice, a friendly word, someone reminding you how rich and multifarious life is. That's what we really need. So writers aren't experts on anything, except feeling perhaps uncertain. And lecturing is arguably the last thing a writer should be doing, which leaves me in an awkward position because I promised I would give you a lecture about how to write a novel. It's not as bad as if you were giving a lecture on how to give a lecture, but it's still a dilemma. So here's what I propose. While I don't claim to have any expertise in writing novels, I do have a certain amount of experience. So what I can do is tell you a little bit about how the last seven years rolled um, and how I wrote my novel. Um, you can think of it as a case study. It may give you some sense of what the process is like. It'll demonstrate how much chance is involved, how much serendipity, how much depends on conversations had or overheard. And it will show you what happens when someone, me, tries to game the system, tries to second guess the story and tell it what direction it should go. Um, afterwards, if it's time, I invite you to ask questions and ask those to the best of my ability. Um, so, Christian wants me to read a bit from the book. Um, maybe I should do that now. I don't know how much, how much time do we have, all told? 20, 20 minutes, half hour? Maybe I'll put the book at the end, I'll just continue with the, with the lecture. So to speak. Um, so I finished this book. Uh, I started this book in 20, November 2017, and I finished it uh, about six weeks ago. So it took about five years all in. Um, and it's set in the Midlands in Ireland uh, during the financial crisis a few years back, which, as most of you know, was devastating um, in all kinds of ways. And the book's about a family, the Barnes family. Each of them takes a turn at narrating. There's Cass, the daughter, PJ, the son, Imelda, the mother, and Dickie, the dad. And Dickie runs a car dealership the local Volkswagen franchise. Uh, so they're high flyers in the town, or they have been, but now with the recession, the car industry has been wiped out and Dickie's business is on the point of collapse. And as the cracks appear and spread, all of these other problems that they've managed to cover up until now with money and stuff and routine, all these other problems are coming to light. And in short, things are not looking good. So the first thing I'd say about this book is that I didn't intend to write it. Um, I didn't intend to write a book set in the Midlands. I particularly didn't have any plan to feature the car industry. Um, I'm not much of a driver at home. I own a car, but it sits in the street most of the time. Um, it's got so little use, it's covered in moss. Um, it has a strangely vegetal smell. If you ride in my car, you'll smell of leaves for like three or four days afterwards. Um, and if I drive it, sooner or later, uh, like a spider will descend from the rear view mirror and sort of wave its legs in outrage. So it's more an ecosystem than a car. Um, uh, so I didn't intend to write this. Um, you're familiar with John Lennon's line, Life is what happens when you're making other plans. That applies even more to books. Um, that is to say, this book emerged from quite a different book that I was trying and failing to write. There's lots of tough moments in the writing process. The second worst moment, I call it a moment, though it goes on for months sometimes, is that point you hit in a novel where you've been working on it for a year or two years and you start to lose faith in it. Um, it's like a relationship. My wife isn't here, so I can say that. Um, you have this honeymoon period with the first draft where everything's like new and exciting um, and moving along quickly. It seems like the book is writing itself. Um, and then inevitably that wears off and you begin to have doubts. And suddenly you realize there are all these parts that aren't working and you don't know if you can fix them. You start to wonder if it'd be better just to scrap it and move on to something else. Sometimes other ideas will present themselves waving at you seductively saying, well, I'm, I won't have any problems, write me instead. Um, but like a relationship, all you can do is stick with it and try to keep believing that it's going to come right, that it's going to be worth doing. And the thing about problems, of course, is that they can be fixed. Although when you lie in your bed at 4 a.m., considering the book in the abstract, uh, it seems unfixable. When you get up and sit at your desk and attack it, the problems one by one, you know, you can usually find you're making progress as slow as it is. Everything sucks till it's good. That's some good advice I got once. Um, 
that's the second worst moment, but much worse than that, not to depress you guys, um, is um, when you're not working on a book. Uh, that interregnum when you finish something and you're trying to start something new. Uh, after years looking forward to finishing the book, like making all sorts of promises to yourself about the things you'll do, the adventures you'll have now you're free, instead you find yourself asking, will I ever write again? Um, and I find it particularly hellish because whenever I'm working on a book, all the ideas I have relate exclusively to that book. So whatever way my mind works, it just will do one project at a time. And what that means is that when it's over, there's like nothing on the horizon whatsoever. Like I have nothing lined up to move on to. So it's like being like dumped by the side of the road with nothing but the clothes on my back. It's very existential. Um, you're a writer with nothing to write. And when you wake up at 4 a.m., there's nothing you can sit down and fix. All you can do is trust that your brain is coming up with something. And it usually is. But the thing about gestation periods is that for a long time, you don't know anything is gestating. It feels more like uh, bereavement. Um, so it's a difficult time. But the reason this book took so long is because when I finished my last book in 2015, I had a plan. I didn't have any ideas for a new book, but a couple of years before, I'd been asked by a friend of mine, an actor called Hugh O'Connor, who some of you may know from My Left Foot, right? Yeah. Uh, if I'd be interested in writing a screenplay. So he was an actor and he wanted to pivot into directing. And I love movies and I'd always wanted to be a screenwriter. Uh, and in fact, in my teens, that was my plan, not to write novels, but to write scripts. So Hugh came along and he told me that if you applied with a treatment to the Irish Film Board, they'd give you money to complete a script. So we came up with an idea, a very simple idea for sort of a high school comedy about two sisters. And one is a goth and one is a preppy and their parents go away for the summer, leaving them alone and chaos ensues. So I wrote a treatment and we made an application to the film board. And as it turned out, they liked it. And we got some money to complete the script. Um, and then I put it to one side while I was completing book three, The Mark in the Void. But now that book was done, I could work on the script full time. Thus, my plan was circumventing the traditional period of dread and emptiness while getting paid, developing possibly a lucrative new sideline. Now, the annals of literature, of course, cluttered with unhappy collisions between writers and the movie business. There are the writers who say, whose books are adapted and rendered unrecognizable. Um, Louis de Bernier famously said, having your book made into a film is like sending your kid to school, and when they come home, their ears are on backwards. Um, there's stories of writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald, who go to Hollywood thinking they can make a quick book and found their lives and talents chewed up by the machine. And for what? Like, Think of your top 10 favorite films. Can you name the writer on any of them? Um, Walter Hill, who wrote Alien and 48 Hours, said the script is the only work of art that is seen exclusively by the people who will destroy it. In short, writers have not been super positive about the movie business. I was familiar with those stories, and yet I didn't feel they applied to me. I thought for me it would be different. The most expensive words in the English language they say are at this time it will be different. Um, but I wasn't expecting a golden ticket. I wasn't expecting uh, a film to be made. Films almost never get made. Something like 99% of scripts never going to, finished scripts never go into production, and that was fine with me. I saw this as a kind of busman's holiday. I'd get funding from the film board. I'd learn the basics of putting together a script. Six months later, when it was all over, I'd return to the world of literature, tanned and relaxed, so to speak, after my holiday, and no doubt brimming with new ideas. Because of course, while I was working on the script, my unconscious would be feverishly coming up with new ideas for a novel. What could go wrong? So we got the funding. I wrote the script, submitted it to the film board again. We had another meeting with them. I found this quite exciting, this business of taking meetings. Uh, with books, no one ever wants to meet you. There's only one question in books, which is, where is your book? Um, so you avoid meeting, uh, uh, <laughs> if at all possible. Um, but in, in the film world, uh, because it's so interpersonal, the, the concept of like being in the room, being good in the room is very important. So Hugh was good in the room, he told me, be quiet. Um, and I just sat there and sort of just, uh, ate the cookies. So the film board liked the script, and I'd made some basic errors in formatting, but they thought it was ready to go into the next stage which is to say they wanted me to rewrite the script, this time working with the production company. And it took me a while to understand that they were talking about you know, making a movie. And it was the one thing I hadn't expected. Uh, even now, after everything that happened, I can recall the excitement that I felt that day. I can feel the allure of those words. Production company, script meeting, scene breakdown, casting session, first day of shooting. It's also glamorous and so dynamic. So unlike the language of novel writing, which revolves around words like desk and blank, and it had all been so easy. Excuse me one sec. 
had all been so easy. My books, which were invariably long and complicated, took years to complete, but I'd written an entire script with characters and conflict with a beginning, middle, and end in a couple of weeks. It was a revelation. And when I met my writer friends now, grinding along with their novels, I couldn't help me feeling a certain amount of pity. It was like watching someone plow a field with some olden days type animal like an ox. Why would you put yourself through that? Then I went to the production company's office, to the writer's room, where I would very soon learn that everything I knew to be the case about the film industry in general was true in my case as well. Traditionally, the screenwriter in the world of movies is right at the bottom of the food chain. It's sort of devil wears Prada situation, where the glamour is there, but you're observing it from under the stiletto of someone's expensive Italian leather boot. Um, producers see scripts as a kind of necessary evil. They would dispense with them altogether if they could and just have two hours of men in tights causing explosions, but they can't. And so you as a scriptwriter are simultaneously the means of an obstacle to getting the script. The producers see the screenwriter as a kind of skivvy come punching bag, a holy fool crossed with the pinata that if they hit enough, they will finally release this mystical yet annoying entity that is the script. Um, before I go on, I should note that I've written scripts since this one, and the experience has been nowhere near as unpleasant. Also, I should make one thing absolutely clear. I do not have a clue how to write a script. Um, I'm ashamed to say that at that point, I'd never actually seen a film script. Uh, I didn't feel it necessary to look at a film script or understand what a film script might be. My understanding was that a script was basically a novel with all everything taken out except the dialogue. And that was why the first draft of the script had seemed so easy, because I was doing it wrong. Um, I hadn't written it in the right software even. I put it into Microsoft Word. And when I did translate it to final draft, it transpired that my script was 150 pages long, meaning it was that my coming of age comedy drama was longer than the director's cut of Apocalypse Now. So if the producers to me seemed like they were determined to enact every cliche of the bullying, know-nothing Hollywood mogul, despite being like a tiny production company in, in Ballsbridge, I must have seemed to them the epitome of the pretentious writer as artist with my beret and my French cigarettes and my alarmingly unprofessional ideas of writing your way into the story and resolving not to know. Because that's the single most crucial difference between writing a novel and writing for the screen. Um, I spoke a moment ago about the importance to a writer of not predetermining where the story is going and instead trying to feel your way into it. Um, Ted Hughes writes about the page as a kind of a window that you're trying to see through. And you have to forget yourself and forget that you're writing even to sort of immerse yourself in that world. You don't think about your reader. And you don't think about your audience because if you think about your reader, then you're going to start trying to impress your reader. And instead of like following the story, you're going to be thinking of ways to make your reader think that you're clever or profound. Um, in film, that not knowing is a luxury you can't afford. Even a micro-budget indie film like ours is exponentially more expensive to make than a book. The film has to pay for itself. So the producers and everyone involved wants to know from the start exactly how it's going to do that. And that needing to know manifests in all sorts of different ways. Um, for one, in film production, everyone's thinking about the audience all the time. Who is the audience? That's the first question they ask. And once they've figured that out, the question becomes, what does this particular audience want? Your script is just one element or ingredient of a product designed to satisfy this imaginary audience. And if they can't conceive of who the audience is, then even if your script's a masterpiece, no one's going to give you money to make it. Um, because they need to know in advance that it's going to work, film producers are obsessed with structure. Um, writers hate structure. Uh, one aim a writer might have with her book would be to create something original, create a voice that sounds fresh. But film, that's absolutely what they don't want to do. Um, what they want to do is make something that's identifiably the same kind of film as previous films that have made money. They want something that the audience, this imaginary audience that dominates their thinking, will look at and immediately recognize as being in the same lineage as Free Willy or Die Hard or whatever. So more than anything, this movie has to fit a template, the same template as every other mainstream movie. There has to be an inciting incident. The hero has to have an identifiable want they will pursue. There has to be a honeymoon moment where everything seems to come together. There has to be a back to square one moment where everything falls apart again. Each of these moments has to be there. Each has to come at a specific preordained time in the movie. Audiences, I was told, unconsciously expect this formula. And if they don't get it, they will switch off. So structure is all important. And the way a real screenwriter would approach a script would be first to come up with a basic idea, then expand that into a 10 page treatment, then divide the treatment into three acts and the acts into scenes. They'd stick a post-it on the wall for every scene. Once there were 70 scenes, they'd have enough for a movie. And only when all that had been done would they think of writing the dialogue for the scenes. Um, I thought that was barbaric. Uh, coming up with the story without looking through the Ted Hughes window seemed like working in the dark. I could come up with the basic plot, but I felt like I wouldn't have any sense who the characters were or why they were doing any of it. So with my initial treatment, 
that I submitted for the very first application to the film board. Rather than write a synopsis for a script that didn't exist yet, I decided to write the script first and then submit a synopsis of that. I thought this was very clever. In fact, it was exactly this, the wrong way to approach it. And if I was writing the screenplay of my screenplay writing ex experience, this would be the scene where I make the tragic mistake that will bring about my downfall because it proved to be almost impossible to retrofit the correct structure onto a script that didn't have it. And that was one reason why the rewrites went on for months and months without end in sight. Um, but I got it. I understood the formula they may, they may be. These decisions were in the context of the movie's business, very rational. Uh, but what slowed the business to a crawl and what makes so many movies so bad, despite their obsession, obsessive attention to structure, is another common yet significantly less rational trait of the business, which is a deep unease with the very existence of the screenwriter. Film, as filmmakers love to tell you, is a visual medium, but it's a medium whose origins are in, the wor are in words. Every movie starts out as a script, image-free words on a page, and that makes filmmakers anxious because words aren't their thing. They see it as a kind of original sin, which is their duty to obscure and uproot as much as they possibly can. And the screenwriter, because he or she deals in this uncanny stuff that is the printed word, is regarded as being in the movie world, but not quite of it. The strange, untrustworthy change link that must be monitored and controlled at all times. And what that means in practice is that all these limits and strictures and formulae will be imposed on the screenwriter as he or she writes the script. But then that script will be at the mercy of every stray thought and opinion passing through the mind of anybody even tang tangentially involved in the movie. So like as a writer, as a novelist, you're sort of in charge, you're in sole control of the world you've created. So editors will sort of step in and give you advice if they think you're making mistakes, but you are free to ignore that advice. Um, they'll let you hang yourself, so to speak. Uh, write the book you want to write. That's, that's kind of what they all say. Um, but with a script, it's completely different. Like everybody wants to put their stamp on us. So you've got like five, six, seven, ten different voices giving you their take on every single aspect of it. And your opinion, the scriptwriter's opinion, counts for no more than anybody else, even if the idea and the story are yours. So no note is too whimsical or idiotic for you to ignore. And the writing process can turn into a series of arbitrary swappings out where the hero goes from a boy to a robot to a duck living in Wisconsin to the moon to at the end of the 13th century. Um, after a while, it becomes hard to remember what the original script was, the reason you're all in the room together. I spoke to a writer once who was charged with adapting a Jane Austen novel for the BBC. He wrote 37 different scripts. Eventually, everything turns to jelly. You have no idea what you're writing or why you're writing it or how this process is going to end, and you can't walk away because the way most screenwriting contracts work, you don't get paid until the first day of shooting. So even if you no longer recognize the movie as your own and you're stumbling through it as a kind of like acid casualty, you're still invested in finishing it regardless or else all your time and effort will be wasted. So that went on for about 18, 18 months. It was like being in a Uyghur re-education camp. Uh, and there's so much more I could talk about here, um, but I want to come back to writing. So I'll just say that after that experience, the script finally got finished and miraculously the money came through to make the movie. Even that was kind of bittersweet because I'd imagined myself hanging out on set, meeting the actors, bonding with the crew. But in fact, the screenwriter, um, screenwriter's involvement ends once the script is done. Sometimes you're, act, you're asked to, to stay on during shooting. Um, to make any last minute changes that might arise, but usually not. Often you're explicitly asked to stay away um, because the director doesn't want the actors coming to you instead of to him to discuss their characters. There has to be one boss on set. It's very hierarchical. And often the first thing the director does when he's hired is to rewrite the script entirely. Um, so I was free, but I was worried because in all this time I hadn't done any writing of my own because I didn't see the script as my own anymore. And it was the longest I think I've gone in my entire life without writing. And of course, all of that time, the post-book anxiety, I thought it so cleverly avoided by taking on the script. The will I ever write a book of, again, dread, had been secretly building and building and building. And in fact, the dread was worse than ever before because although I'm not superstitious in general, I worry about two things, doing things that will hex my writing. Um, if anyone here has read The Gift by Will Lewis Hyde, does anybody know that book? Um, if you're a creator of any stripe, yeah, um, it's just such a wonderful book about creativity. Uh, and the basic idea is like that the capacity to create is a gift from the gods or the muses or the universe, whatever it is. Um, and your job as a creator is to honor that gift with your time and your labor and then pay it forward by putting the outcome, the artwork, into the, into the world. And I had doubts about whether my robot Duck on the Moon movie counted as honoring my gift. And I wondered during my year and a half of whether during my year and a half of, of hack work I might have alienated my muse. But 
When I returned to my office, I found I did have some ideas. Like I had three different ideas for three very different books. And I spoke earlier about like the worst and second worst times you can have as a writer. The best time, conversely, is when you get an idea. Um, when that seed comes to you in whatever form it takes, like it's a, like a line or joke or an image, like it's usually something like incredibly throwaway. But when you write it down, you can tell it's the start of something because all these other ideas will follow on from it and kind of cluster around us in a cascade. And so fast sometimes that it, you're struggling even to write them down. And it's exhilarating. And at times like that, it's easy to believe in mystical, mythical concepts like muses and, and uh, divine inspiration. And I had three of these ideas, look at me, right? And as I say, they were very different. So one idea was set in the near future, a kind of virtual metaverse where this guy's playing games set in different worlds, um, with the World War II space, and finds first that the game worlds are sort of interpenetrating each other, and then that people from his past, ghosts, are starting to infiltrate the games. And one was a kind of urban gothic set in a school where my wife had worked in a very underprivileged part of Dublin. And one was a comic two-hander uh, where a rich boy from the South Dublin suburbs and a girl from the Midlands with a scar on her arm meet and fall in love in Trinity College. And each of these ideas I found intriguing in its own way. And the more I explored them, the richer the worlds became and the more the possibilities each of them offered. It seemed like my busman's holiday plan had paid off. And while I'd been laboring over my screenplay, my unconscious mind had been cooking up this feast. There was only one small unexpected problem and I couldn't decide which book to write. So instead I developed them, as you might develop a treatment for a movie. Without writing a word of actual prose, I began figuring out a plot for each of these ideas, delineating the characters, detailing the movement scene by scene. And I kept going with this, even though like as a teacher, I'd always advise uh, writers like not to work out their plot beforehand um, because inevitably when you start writing it, um, your characters will want to do stuff other than the plot you've written for them. So either you'll force them to do what you want and it'll be ruined, uh, or else you'll, you'll, uh, you'll just have to throw your plot out the window. And also because just more generally, um, you know, there's a thousand ways to sharpen your pencil and waste your time before starting a book. If you want to think of reasons to, to put it off, um, you can always do it. And the best thing is always to write. To begin, begin. That's the writing advice that I very smugly have given many times uh, in class. But when it came to it here, I didn't want to do it. Um, I just kept writing these notes, notes and notes and notes and notes and notes. And it was as if, like, on a dating app, I'd matched three wonderful people. But instead of taking the next step and actually concretely meeting them in real life, I instead tried to hedge my bets by continuing to accumulate information about them in order to figure out the absolute best choice. Or to pick a more rarefied example, um, some of you may be familiar with The Snow Leopard, Peter Matheson's book about, so it was Peter Matheson who died a couple of years ago. Um, in the 70s, he went to the Himalayas and he traveled around looking for this, this uh, elusive snow leopard. Um, and there's a moment where he's crossing a ravine. He's very into Buddhism. He, he's crossing a ravine on a path that's only like 10 inches wide. And the void is kind of yawning beneath him. And he's terrified, of course. And he's clinging to the side of the cliff. And it comes into his mind, because that's the kind of guy he is, that in ancient Egyptian, to clutch the mountain meant to die. It's a synonym for death. You can't cling to life and live it at the same time. So clinging to the mountain, avoiding IRL meetups, however you want to put it, that's what I was doing with my ideas. I wasn't ready not to know. After so long away from writing, I couldn't take a risk on something that might not succeed. I wanted to be sure. Even though I knew in writing, you can never be sure. Even when the book is done, even if they've just given you the Nobel Prize, you can never know for sure that it's good. So I just kept compiling these files of notes for each idea. And as the months went by, the files got bigger and bigger and longer and longer until for each of the ideas, I just fully worked out plot, at a title, at an entire dramatist persona, at scene breakdowns, still I couldn't choose. Um, and I was going insane without having written a word. So finally, I sent the treatments to my editor and asked him which one I should do. And I went to meet him in London. And he was great. Sometimes with an intractable problem, all you need is like a fresh pair of eyes. And here's what he told me. He said, the virtual reality book, great idea. He said, I worry you'll never finish this. He said, every book you have ever written has run long. He said, the synopsis for this is like 30 pages long. So this could easily be 2,000 pages. So he didn't trust me to write it. Uh, Urban Gritty Gangster Book, his quote was, my wife would not read this. And there's a window into the publishing world's uh, logic. My editor's first criterion for a viable book was, would my wife read this? His wife would read, he thought, the romantic comedy 200 set in Trinity about the South Dublin boy and the girl from the Midlands with the scar on her arm who fall in love. Um, it seemed like it would be short. It had commercial appeal and it could be turned around reasonably quickly. So that's the one you should do, he said. Great. Um, I was sorry to relinquish the other ideas, but I was happy to have an answer at last. We drew up a contract. There was a press release. I went home to start the book. 
The hard work had already been done. I had the whole plot figured out. I had individual scenes mapped out. I had pages of dialogue. So really, it was just a case of filling in the blanks. So I sat down at my desk, and I started to write. And after a paragraph, I realized, I don't want to do this. <laughs> it's not that I didn't like it. There was lots of funny moments, zany characters and situations. It just didn't interest me. Um, coming back to the dating app, um, I've never used a dating app, sorry. This could be completely wrong. <laughs> but uh, it was as if the imaginary dating app had used all its like magical powers and found the absolutely most perfect, imaginably gorgeously, hilariously, brilliantly perfect person you'd ever wanted in your life. Uh, and then you finally go and meet them, and as soon as you walk in the door, like, there's no spark, you realize, oh, no, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, does that sound accurate? I don't know if that's, yeah. <laughs> so why was there no spark with this idea I'd spent so long on? Could it be that with the whole plot mapped out, there was no reason to write the book? Um, or was it the times, I wondered? This was 2017, the news was full of Trump, Brexit, Bolsonaro, writing a boy meets girl romance in an elite university seemed rather frivolous. I note here that Sally Rooney did not feel it was frivolous. Went on to write a boy meets girl romance in Trinity College that about five million people bought. So I feel like my unerring, unerring sense of like how not to make money was also kind of coming into play there. Um, but anyway, joking aside, now he's in real trouble because at the same moment I knew that I didn't want to write the other ideas either. I'd scripted all of him to death. I'd clung to the mountain. Now he's stuck inside of a fucking mountain. What was I going to do? Because I had a contract now. There was a press release. My editor was going to call next week to see how I was getting on. Editors loved doing this. And I had nothing. Or almost nothing. There's one mystery I hadn't managed to pre-solve. The boy girl, Trinity Romance, the girl from South Dublin. The boy from South Dublin, I didn't care about him. I knew him too well already. He was just like an idiot. Um, but the girl from the Midlands with the scar on her arm, how did she get the scar? I didn't know. And I kept thinking about that. And as I thought about it, I got a call from a friend asking if I wanted to go for a drink. Uh, Yeats, when he ran out of ideas for his poems, famously visited the foul rag and bone shop of his heart. But W.H. Auden used to say to his students that given a choice between staying into work on their poems and going to a party, they should always go to the party. Parties are full of people, people are full of stories, and stories are what writers need. Um, and there's one ability that I have that I'm truly grateful for, and that's I'm a good listener. I don't know if I'm a very empathetic person. I don't know if I care about the people who are telling me the stories, but I can listen to the stories. And because uh, there's so few people who apparently seem to know how to listen, and people are very generous with their stories. Uh, so I went to meet my friend, and I told her I had this fragment of an idea about a girl from the Midlands with a scar on her arm. And she told me she'd just been to the Midlands, to Kennedy Castle, County Offaly, where her friend Memo was getting married. I've got a story for you, she said. Listen to this. And the story was that on the day of the wedding, this girl, Memo, this is a true story, was driving with her father to the church, when suddenly, out of nowhere, she starts to scream, screaming and screaming at the top of her lungs. And her father's there in the car with her, uh, and his first reaction was that she was having second thoughts about the marriage. And he'd never been super keen on the groom, so he kind of thought, well, I sort of saw this coming. But she started thrashing around and around, and he realized it wasn't just cold feet, it was a bee. A bee had flown in through the open window and got caught up in the bride's veil, and she was freaking out. And I love this image, like just a bee, like a little seed, a little atom of life floating in through the window, floating into our mind, turning all our plans upside down. What a great opening for a book, I thought. Uh, I've got to use that story. And I thought Cass, the girl from the Midlands, I don't want her getting married, but maybe her, the bride could be her mother. And who's she on her way to marry? Who would Cass's father be? So a couple of days later, I was talking to my friend Anne-Marie, and I told her about this girl and the wedding in Kennedy Castle. And Anne-Marie said she knew it well, because she'd grown up in Burr, in Offaly, where Kennedy Castle is. She didn't have a good word to say about Burr. She started telling me about her stepfather, who'd been a car dealer. Very wealthy, a big wheel in the town. Um, in the 1980s, when Ireland was like just really a third world country, the car dealers were like, like kings. Um, they lived a different sort of life. Um, the manufacturers would send them on all kinds of like boondogs. They'd go on cruises. So Anne read all these like Polaroids of her father and mother um, on cruise ships, going to the Mediterranean, going to Africa with cocktails. Cocktails, you couldn't get a cocktail the length of breath of Ireland in the 1980s. But this was the world the car dealers lived in. Um, and in the boom, of course, they were status, stratospherically successful. Um, and this guy was kind to this, this, this uh, man, Dennis. So people would come to, them, come to him with their sob stories. You'd always have like, the wallet out, giving kind of money out to just folks in the street. Um, and jobs to every sort of unemployable layabout in the town. He'd find something to do for them in the dealership, uh, like sweeping floors, whatever it might be. Until in 2008, with the crash, the car industry collapsed, and the dealership went bust. And the townspeople said, 
Dennis Hickey got too big for his boots. Oh, Dennis Hickey thought he's a big cheese. Well, look at him now. Um, this man who'd been a pillar of the community, he'd been so generous with his money and his time all the time, the townsfolk hated him for it. And that small town bitterness struck me as so perfect. And I thought to myself, well, that's the dad. He's the car dealer. And that's going to be the, the backdrop. So slowly the glimmerings of a new story, or maybe the real story, becoming like visible amid the ashes of the old story. But what was it about? I could place the girl in the town. I knew who the mother and the father were. I could see the car business struggling, but I needed another element. Um, I knew the past had to play a part because this was Ireland with always some secret lying half buried in the yard, but what was it? I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there's a book called The Secret. Anybody remember The Secret? The self-help book uh, that became very popular and the claim it made was that you could get anything you wanted if you simply asked the universe. Ask the universe, that was the slogan. The idea was like that the universe, like some very solicitous waiter, would just be hovering at your shoulder at all times, waiting for you to articulate your demands so it could make them real. People bought this. Um, at the time, I found this idea ridiculous, as if, for example, the tragedy in Fukushima could be avoided if someone had simply asked the universe to stop the nuclear reactor exploding. But sometimes, working as a writer, things will come together, just fall into your lap in a way that even to a cynic will seem to verge on the mystical. So. A couple of days after my conversation with Anne-Marie, I ran into Joe, um, and I told him I had these very vague outlines for a book. I wanted it to be set in the Midlands. I wanted it to involve the car industry in some way. Um, if you know Joe at all, you'll know he's full of surprises. Um, he's from the Midlands, so I knew he had some interesting take on this, but I did not expect him to say what he said next. Um, ladies and gentlemen, did you know that Joe Nugent Joycean, polymath, renowned professor of literature, was in a past life a car salesman? Because <laughs> because I sure did not. But that's what he told me. Before he came to the US and began his studies in Berkeley, California, Joe ran the Volkswagen dealership in Mullingar County, West Meath. You think you know someone, ladies and gentlemen. If you think about it, it makes kind of sense because he's very persuasive. I gather he's managed to persuade BC to spend all kinds of money on esoteric schemes. Um, but there was more to it than that. The dealership had in fact been Joe's father's. Joe had never had any intention of running it. He left the Midlands, was living in Dublin, when one day, he's 23 or 24, he got the news out of the blue that his father had passed away unexpectedly. And then and there, Joe's life in Dublin came to an end. He had to go back to the Midlands, take over the family business in Mullingar. And the story didn't end there. There was all kinds of adventures in Joe's brief, not 100% successful career in retail. But already I had like everything I needed, like a past from a fictional family for the fictional dad, who in my novel has carved out quite another life for himself when he found himself uh, called home to be the dutiful son. So this time I didn't hang around. I didn't map out the plot or figure out every character's top 10 pizza toppings. I sat down at my desk, let go of the mountain. Um, and that's the end of the story. Like, that's, that's, uh, it's strange to be talking about a book that hasn't been published yet because who knows, it could be a disaster. Uh, and you will all think, well, what we all need to do is write the, to the exact opposite of what Paul Murray said in the lecture. Um, <laughs> so at this point, all I can say about it really is that writing it made me very happy, uh, even though maybe because it had a lot of sadness in it. It continued to interest me over that, that uh, five-year period all the way through COVID, it kept me company. And if that's all it amounts to, it would still feel to me like a gift. Um, I guess the main thing I learned or, or relearned, because I feel like the important things in life are lessons you learn and forget over and over and over again, um, is that the world is full of stories. Um, so even though as a writer, you're alone a lot of the time, in the same way you've got this exposure to, to people and their lives that is uh, profound and valuable. Um, and the muses aren't always Greek ladies in togas. Sometimes it's your roommate, sometimes it's a relative, sometimes it's an urbane professor of literature, sometimes it's the person sitting next to you on the bus, a total stranger with a story that turns out to be the piece that doesn't complete the jigsaw, but makes you realize for the first time it's a, there's a picture in your mind that's slowly coming together. Uh, so like, that's it, I don't know, what's, what's the, what do you want to do? Do you want to, like, do you want to read a bit or? Okay, how long have we got? All right, doesn't matter? All right, okay. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna read a bit. So this is the boy, PJ is his name, and he's the son of the, of the car dealer. He's 12. Uh, it's summer. How much swearing are you guys up for? I don't know how rude I can make this. Like, it's super rude. You think it's... Really? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. You, 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 think, you, think, you think that. Maybe you don't realize how rude it is. 
Okay, anybody who doesn't want to hear like super rude words, block your ears. The woods of Belarus are a maze, a green snow-laden maze that switches itself around whenever you turn your back. The cold is blistering. The enemy is everywhere. Gray flashes in the branches, almost too fast to see. Behind you, Nev calls. PJ spins around just in time to see a rifle pointed at him. A shadowed figure fix him in his sight. Incoming! He hurls himself into a hollow as a grenade comes down, rolls at the blast, crashes against a tree, hauls himself to his feet, rises up and runs without looking back into the trees, the light. This way, Nev calls, going the wrong way. Light slams through the branches. It twists and needles. Knives of light, rivers of light, walls of light that turn and flip and bear down on him. The faster he goes, the more his chest feels like it's going to burst open. Incoming! Another grenade lands at his feet. Wait a second, PJ says, coming to a stop. Are you throwing this at me? It was a sniper, Nev calls back, because you're so slow. Snipers don't throw grenades, PJ said. But Nev has disappeared into the trees ahead. He hurries after him, but his lungs are burning and his feet are on fire too, screaming like he's running on razors. The sky, red and purple, shrinks and darkens into a ball, a whirling back ball, black ball of pain. He drops to his knees and collapses onto the soft earth, reaches for his inhaler. The sky opens up again. The forest stops being on fire. He unlaces his runners. Those are sneakers, sorry. Pulls them off as delicately as he can. He feels like, it feels like most of his skin comes with him. In the distance, he can hear Nev crashing through the undergrowth, a nearby something scuffling. Scuff, scuff, rustle, rustle, right by his head. It's a squirrel. Holy shit, it's a red squirrel. It's perched on the log, quite motionless, like it's materialized from another world, which maybe it has. The woods are full of greys, but he's never seen a red squirrel here before. Hey there, buddy. From its log, the squirrel considers him. Very, very, very slowly, PJ reaches into his pocket and takes out his phone. I'm just taking a picture, that's all, he tells the squirrel. The squirrel cocks its head amicably, as if to say, we cool? Incoming! That was a voice. A rock thumps down in front of him. When he looks around, the squirrel is gone like it was never there. What are you doing just sitting there? Nev stumps up. You can't just take a break when we're on a mission. In real life, I could actually shoot you for disobeying orders. I saw a squirrel, PJ says. I was trying to take a picture of a squirrel, and you scared it away. You think in World War II they stopped to take pictures of squirrels? Nev says. I thought we were searching for a base. All right, all right, PJ says. Is there a day to play this dumb game? Nev reminds him. Okay, I'm coming, PJ says. He reaches for his sneakers. Jesus Christ, says Nev. What the fuck is wrong with your feet? The rain is gone, now it's summer. But the way the heat keeps rising and rising, it's almost like water in a flood. At nighttime, it'll fall back a little bit, but then come morning, it'll start up again. And soon have mounted higher than it was the day before, leaving you submerged at the bottom. There's a ban on watering gardens. The lawns are brown. The fire brigade keeps having to go out to the mountains to put out coarse fires. In town, everyone's acting happy. Isn't it great, they tell each other, the butcher, the barber, standing around outside their shops in the shimmering air. But under their shirts, dark patches appear, and silver sprinkles of moisture break out over their scalps. And you can tell underneath they're feeling hot and tired and mean. It's angry weather, almost like the colorless cloud of wrath that surrounded Mum for so long has detached itself from her and shifted outside where it's expanded to engulf everything. It would be fine if PJ could just stay indoors. One time they went on holidays to Egypt, and every time you stepped outside, it was like someone was incinerating you with a magnifying glass. So they ended up not going anywhere, not even the pyramids. They just stayed in the hotel and swam in the pool and watched Egypt documentaries in the hotel TV. In PJ's opinion, it was one of the family's best ever holidays. But this summer, needless to say, they're not going anywhere. And though the house is cool and there's a TV just waiting to be watched, fat chance of doing that. Instead, every morning it's, are you kids just gonna lie in bed all day? Then as soon as he's up, it's, would you kids ever get out from under my feet? You kids, by the way, means him, PJ. Mam seems to have given up yelling at Cass, who, if she does actually come down for breakfast, brings it right back upstairs with her. But Mam makes PJ sit at the breakfast bar, then complains about the racket he's making. His chewing is too loud. His phone is too loud. One time she gives out to him for his constant blinking. PJ Barnes, my, my wit's end with you, she says. She's always at her wit's end. She's like a human tripwire, just waiting for him to set her off. That's why the best plan, the only plan, is to get out early, stay out as long as he can, lose himself in the suffocating, airless tunnels of the forest. They continue into the labyrinth. The ground underfoot is dry and snapping, crackles like a fire. Where's this amazing place you wanted to show me, Nev says. Uh, well, says PJ, this is it. This? He looks around him in case he's mistaken. He's not. This is a shed, he says. Right, PJ says. I mean, to the naked eye. It's an old, empty shed, Nev says, with holes in the walls. Yes, PJ begins, but he trails off. It's weird. When he comes here on his own, or with Zargam, there's always a kind of an atmosphere like you can easily imagine you're in a ruin of the distant past or a shattered base in a post-apocalyptic wilderness. But with Nev, sure enough, it does just seem to be like a small, even pokey stone shed with a rusty roof and weeds in the corners. I thought there was going to be something in it, Nev says. He's enjoying being disgruntled. I can't believe you brought me all the way here to look at a shed. There is something in it, PJ says. I mean, there has been. Like, sometimes my sister comes out here with her friends and they have parties. For ages, they have, like, they had a stack of beer right there in that corner. Nev looks at the empty, beerless corner. They call it the bunker. 
PJ perseveres. You know, like Hitler's bunker. Nev sighs deeply. I think you'll find the Fuhrer bunker was underground, he says. Like, that was the entire point of it. Right, PJ says. Um, I'm not sure why they call it that. Nev doesn't respond. He stands with his hands on, the hips, on his hips, surveying in dissatisfaction the meager dimensions of the shed and the also unsatisfying, but for different reasons, expanse of the forest outside. Then slowly light goes on. Do you think they ever had sex here, he says. I don't know, PJ says. I thought you watched them, Nev says. Didn't you say you came out here and you watched them? I saw them a couple of times, PJ says. I saw they were having a party. I didn't watch them. Anyway, they haven't been out here in ages. Nev's face darkens again. PJ realizes too late he should have leveraged the voyeuristic potential here, but he remembers something else. Then this other time, just before the summer holidays, I came out here and the whole bunker shed, Nev says. The whole shed was full of car car parts, like car parts. Then when I came back the next morning, they were gone. Zargam had been with him that day. They were sure it must be smugglers. They tracked through the whole forest looking for tire tracks, footprints. They thought they saw a stranger way off the distance. But PJ, but Nev appears unmoved. He looks at the floor with a traumatized expression, like PJ has kidnapped him and is holding him hostage here. I'm hungry, he says. Ah, in that case, re-energized, PJ goes to a corner and with a flourish pulls back what appears to be a part of the dirt floor, but is in fact a dirt-covered towel under which is a hole, and in the hole is a box. Tuck in, he says, opening the box. Nev looks in the box, then up at PJ. What the fuck is this, he says. Herring fillets, pineapple slices. I only took stuff my mother would notice, PJ says apologetically. But look, there's energy bars too, see? Nev turns away in disgust. disgust. I want something cold, he says, like it's been in a fridge. He turns to PJ with a full body plea that's been undoubtedly perfected over countless trips to the supermarket suite section. Can we go back to your house? Uh, well, we could, PJ says, though maybe not right now the second. Nev narrows his eyes, glitters evilly. Oh, I forgot, he says. You want to stay out of your mom's way because you're worried she'll send you to boarding school. No, I'm not, PJ says. I'd be worried, Nev says. You'll probably get raped there. That's what happens at boarding school, he says, opening an energy bar, raping. Last summer, PJ went to a camp for the whole of July. There was art in the morning. Choose your own sport after lunch. He chose archery. Zargon was there too. In fact, most of his class was. He won a medal for a seashell mosaic of a stunt truck and another for best beginner at archery. But this year he said he didn't want to go. You don't? Dad sounded surprised. I thought you enjoyed it. I did, PJ says, but sometimes it's better with things you enjoy not to do them again, or else if you don't enjoy them the second time, it also wipes out the first time. Okay, Dad says dubiously. Also, it didn't leave me much time to myself. Like, I spent the whole year playing games with my friends in class, so summer's a good chance to, you know, be alone. You won't be bored hanging around by yourself all day? No way, PJ shook his head emphatically. Anyway, Nev will be around. Oh, right, Dad said. You like him, don't you? I do, PJ said. I really do. It's all part of the strategy. Lie low. Act unobtrusive. A drain on our time and money? On the contrary, we barely notice he's around. Good old PJ. Why would we send him to boarding school? Unfortunately, the only other kid not in summer camp is Nev, so PJ stuck with him. Nev doesn't go to camp. Because it's not because his family is going broke and it's a real stretch this year, but because he's a tendency to rub his peers the wrong way. And the camp organizers have explained to his parents there's only so much protection they can give him. PJ tries to accept it. Think of it as the penance he would have got for his sins if he'd gone to confession. That is, this summer with Nev is like his punishment for whatever, his, for whatever it is he did. And when he gets back to school, he'll be all clear. But sometimes he cycles by O'Malley Park and sees the kids playing in camp and imagines he's there with them, playing rounders, improving his dribbling skills. Also, according to Zargam, they have batik this year, so maybe doing batik. And at lunchtime, sitting beside Zargam on the bleachers in the shade, asking if he wants to swap his Capri son for a Kit Kat. The frustrating thing is that it doesn't have to be a punishment summer at all. With weather like this, it could be an amazing summer, a legendary summer, and you wouldn't even need to go to camp. If Zargon was around, you'd be in the forest morning till night. You'd never even think of going inside. With Nev, by contrast, there's endless complaints about poor phone signal or needles in his shorts or too many ants, and it's a constant battle to keep him from flouncing off home. But actually, the frustration is with himself. He could have his legendary summer if he could just be on his own, and he does try. Banished from the house, he'll go to the roadside, He'll, return to, he'll go to the bunker and sit under a tree in the sun, eating a pineapple slice or a herring fillet and reading The Shining. And yes, with the birds singing and the grasshoppers ticking and a couple of butterflies dancing by, he'll recognize, yes, it's pretty freaking cool, close to perfect, in fact, which makes it all the more infuriating when sooner or later he feels the cold, damp prickling come, like a shadow falling over him, except a shadow that falls from the inside, because once it does, he knows it will rise there amid the trees in the sunlight till everything's blacked out and throwing his book down and cursing himself. Fucking shit, you stupid fucking lamer for being sad, for caring is alone. He'll leave the forest to call on Nev. Thank you very much.
not done yet, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm sure there are going to be a, a couple of questions about how more to write a model here, right? Sure. Okay, good. So they, um, I can hand a mic around just to pick up. Um, didn't I have another one? Where did it go? Courtney, didn't have another mic up here. Oh, maybe it's behind the, no, it's not there. All right. Ah, the, okay. <laughs> Beast is coming out when? When, when is the, um, uh, whatever it is uh, for our it's coming out next August. Next August? Yeah. So it's a ways away yet. You mean like August 25? <laughs> August 23, August 23, thank God for that, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks Paul. I'm a grad student here at BC. Um, and it, I know you talked about sort of drawing inspiration from your friends, Joe, for example, uh, from real life. And I know, obviously, when you convert that into fiction, different characters, different people, but do you feel like over the course of kind of writing someone else's story or thinking about someone else's story as content for your own work, you get to know them better? Do you feel, are you thinking about them while you're writing? Are you sort of, I don't know, yeah. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, uh, I think that, Writers are uh, pretty, I'm trying not to say psychopaths, but I, I think that they're pretty, uh, they're pretty uh, clinical uh, in using what they need. So, um, well, there's two reasons for that. So, so someone could tell me like a long story uh, and I might think to myself, well, that entire story could go into, could make a book. Um, but inevitably what I'll find is that the whole story doesn't interest me or it doesn't fit. It's just one little kernel that will fit. And that one little kernel might need to be massaged and changed, usually it will, um, for it to kind of do what I need it to do. So that's just, that's to say, uh, like, no, I think I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, well, uh, that's, the, that's kind of the flip answer. Like what I do feel, so, so much I, I didn't have time to put in this like already very long lecture. Like every book you write, I feel like is a reaction to the book you've written before. The book I wrote previous to this was, uh, it's called The Mark and the Void, and it was like, it was about banking. It was like super technical. It was tons of research. Uh, and it was in all the characters of these like very kind of brilliant, but kind of uh, mathematically minded kind of calculating people. Um, so when I came to, the, to this book, I, I didn't want to research. I wanted to do something that didn't involve, didn't involve research that involves like, Real people, like I mean, bankers are real, but but I wanted to 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 write about people who you'd meet in the street, um, and maybe it's because I, I'm getting older. I don't know, but uh, people have so much pain in their lives, and uh, I talk to anybody for any length of time, and they'll have some kind of just people are walking around with these like crazy crazy crosses on their back all the time, um, and it's really interesting. Uh, but it's also really it makes me feel. Uh, um, I want to tell these stories, you know? Um, so so I, can, I can't tell them all, I can just tell little bits of them. There's a writer called Svetlana Alexeyevich, who's from Belarus, and her books are all just like narratives. Like, so it'll be just like 100, 200 different, you know, interviews with people, just about what it's like to be in the Russian army, what it's like to be, uh, you know, uh, in Chechnya during the war, what it's like to be, um, to have, to have been around when, when communism fell. And they're fantastic. She's just, this, she, whatever she does, she just elicits these stories from people um, that, would, um, that would break your heart. Uh, and I'd love to do that sometime, but that's, that's probably not, I think ultimately I probably wouldn't find it satisfying. But, uh, but yeah, Jesus, like the stories, the stories that are out there. Every, every week my students come to class with these, like, these great students, and they always have these stories. Some are funny, some are like heartbreaking, but there's always like something that you kind of think, you know, I can use this. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. I, I like your answer, so that's not why I'm doing that class. But oh, okay, <laughs> go for it, yeah, yeah. You got what you need, that's it. No, 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 Hi, Paul, I'm Julia, I'm hey. a first year MA student. Um, and so I really enjoyed hearing your thoughts on um, like the gestation period of writing a book, but also how, you know, as you're writing, the book, you're kind of following what the characters want to do and keeping an open mind about it. Um, but I think there's a real 
intricacy and depth to your writing that I, I really admire. Um, and so I'm curious, as you're you know, following what the characters want to do, how do you then work on fitting you know, the development of a new puzzle piece into the other characters' narratives? And how do we all interweave together? Like, how, what's that process like? How do I get them all to fit together? Yeah. Yeah. Um, difficulty. Yeah. That's. I mean, again, that's, no. That's, that's a really good question because uh, I like I like plots. Like lots of literary writers, sort of feel plots are a bit sort of you know in for dig. Um, I like books to have a story, um, and I like constructing plots. Uh, at the same time, I feel like they have to be character driven, um, or else they just like don't they don't feel alive to me. So there's there's definitely that conflict between the character and the plots, um, and the answer is that just like experimenting, just doing this, doing it over and over and over again. Uh, and what will happen is, like I do map stuff out, like without every book, like I'll, I'll sort of, like I'll have some kind of idea what the plot is going to be for the next sort of 30 pages, 50 pages. Um, and what will happen is when I write the scene, and it all sounds really kind of bogus when I say this, but it's true. I'll write the scene and it just won't work. Like just whatever I've got like planned for the characters, I'll just go like, oh, wait, wait a second. You know, what's, for some reason, like this, the characters, I always say they don't want to do it, but it, it just it feels false for them to do these things. So obviously, I think I know who the characters are, um, but something about the situations that I've put them in um, doesn't ring true. Uh, so I have to try it again with something else, uh, some other take it in some other direction, um, and that's that's like that's that's basically it. Like it's just it's it's, it's it's like this this endless process of revision, like over and over again, um, until you can achieve this kind of um, synthesis between the, the character arcs and like sort of the overall kind of plot arc. But it's, um, it's, it's, like, again, you don't want to be mystical about these things, but, but uh, my sense is that there's, there's like, there's a book in there somewhere. It's like, you know, they say like, was, who was it? Like, was it Michelangelo? It might've been Protagoras who like, like the block of marble, he could see the statue and he's just liberating the, the statue from the block. So like with the book, um, my sense is like rightly or wrongly that like there's a book somewhere in this morass of words and I've just got to keep changing it until, until I find out, until I, until I get to it, until it feels right, like the, the kind of the spatiality of it like feels, like feels right. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just about sort of, you know, chipping away at your little chisel over and over again until, until that, 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 that happens. Thanks for the question. Thanks so much. This got me really thinking, Julia's question there, because you said you wanted to write a novel, and I really don't understand it. I'm looking at it from the outsider. Uh, really impressed by, by the way you presented the whole process. So, so you were saying before that you want to write a novel about real people, common stories. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to be, on the one hand, an Aksayevich kind of story of just a compendium. You want to write your own novel, right? Out of it, weave it into a story which is unique. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm a bit confused now with your answer to, to Julia, because on the one hand, real people in everyday life don't have a script, right? And they get things wrong, and it's never quite perfect. So you know what your characters are doing, and you say what they're doing is not quite right, but that's what we do all day long. We do mm -hmm. things wrong and not quite right. Mm -hmm. It's the novel, Mm -hmm. which is an artificial exercise which gets it right because it's a set piece. Mm -hmm. And therefore, by definition, it's not common people doing normal things because it's the one chance to get it right the way it should be, mm -hmm. as opposed to real life where we get it wrong all the time. How do you square that? <laughs> who is this guy? <laughs> do you know who this guy is? I don't know who he is. <laughs> um, uh, you get to ask him a question there, please. <laughs> I've got a... Uh, well, I mean, I don't think people in novels do get it right. I think people's novels are are, are um, getting it wrong all the time. I think that's the that's the, the beauty of novels. Lucky Jim is the first thing that comes to mind. Of just it's just a series of disastrous mistakes that he makes. Um, I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but but when I was writing this the, the lecture, I just kept coming back. Has anybody seen adaptation movie adaptation? Yeah, no. Uh, there's a great there's a great scene in it where. Um, Maybe maybe that's maybe I should leave that. Uh, I don't know, guy. I mean, I, th I feel like what you're, you're saying, like you're saying that like I'm tricking people because I'm taking real real sort of situations and I'm kind of like I'm kind of kind of bending them to sort of fit this kind of like this web this kind of simulacrum that I've that I've invented myself uh, for for financial gain. Uh, and it's like <laughs> that's, 
That's only partly true. If you knew how little financial gain there was, you'd realize it was, a, it was the wrong track to take. Um, yeah, I, I, I take your point. Um, I guess what I meant was that I didn't want to write about people who were brilliant uh, or special. Uh, I wanted to write about just folks walking around uh, on the street uh, and the situations that they would encounter. Um, and I wanted to try and find for myself the same um, complexity uh, and density uh, of like of plot and illusion and whatever else that I could find you with with sort of with characters who were brilliant and special. Um, I wanted to find on um, like a textual level. Uh, I wanted to see if I could write in a real person's voice, uh, which is to say, using simple words, um, and make that as as see if I could like like find some kind of like, power in there that would sort of, without using sort of, so I had, a I had a teacher once who called Ali Smith and she had this concept of this, the safe trap. Um, and the safe trap is like when, when as, like, as I've been saying, like most of the time you don't know what you're doing when you're writing. And the safe trap is you fall back on what you're good at. Um, and what I'm good at is jokes. I'm very good at jokes. So I wanted to see if I could write something like with no, like, or fewer jokes. Um, so just like sort of more kind of like not, not like sort of like a kitchen, kitchen sink drama, but uh, closer to sort of like a naturalistic novel than I had done hitherto. Um, so I was just trying to change it up, you know? Um, and to your point about like, uh, if I understand you correctly, about sort of real life not, not, not fitting, into, fitting into an arc. I will read a quote. So this film is called Adaptation, which I recommend to you very highly. Um, and it's, it's written by a scriptwriter called Charlie Kaufman. He's a very brilliant man. And it's about a scriptwriter called Charlie Kaufman. He's blocked. Uh, he's lost faith in his, in, his, in his script. And he goes to see this screenwriting guru uh, called Robert McKee, who's a real figure. But in the film, he's played by uh, Brian Cox, who you may know from, has anyone seen Succession? Brian Cox is the dad in Succession. So Charlie Kaufman, played by Nicolas Cage in the film, um, He's, he's, he's kind of, he sweats all the time. He's like, he hunches up. He, and he says, he puts up his hand in the middle of his audience and he says to, to, to Robert McKee, you know, can, 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 and Robert McKee's like, he, he's like, he wrote this book called Story, which is the definitive, you know, here is like the, here is the formula for writing a film. Here's all the stuff you have to do. Here's all the bits that fit together and here's where you have to do it. Um, so Nicholas or Kaufman asks him, can you have a film like without a story that's more like real life, you know, where people struggle and they don't get anywhere and they get frustrated and nothing ever really changes? Um, and Brian Cox, Robert McKee replies, how could you think for a moment that nothing happens? I'm gonna try and do it, okay? Instead of answering your question. How could you think for a moment that nothing happens in the real world? People are murdered every day. There's genocide, war, corruption. Every fucking day, someone in the world sacrifices his life to save somebody else. Every fucking day, someone, somewhere, takes a conscious decision to destroy someone else. People find love, people lose it, for Christ's sake. A child watches his mother beaten to death on the steps of a church. Someone goes hungry. Somebody else betrays his best friend for one. If you can't find that stuff in life, my friend, then you know crap about life. And why the fuck are you wasting my precious two hours with your movie? So that's Charlie, Ka Charlie, Charlie Kaufman put in his place. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, that's my answer to your, <laughs> to your question, yeah. You got it all, you got to, I guess you got you to make it make sense. You've got to sort of, you got to crystallize things and make them into something that can be, uh, that has um, a form. Um, so you're taking sort of the chaos of, of experience and turning it into something that uh, we can temporarily make sense of using the sort of this, the lie that leads us to the truth. That's Picasso's definition of, of art. So, so yeah, it's a lie, but it's also the truth. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, I'm reading, I'm sorry for my voice. Actually, I'm reading uh, the Mark and the Void. Oh, great. And I think to uh, part of your, your question is um, the characters sort of make brushes on each other. And quite often there's a dialogue. So when, when one of the characters, the, the antagonist, he makes a statement that's kind of off base. The others come in with their opinion of what he's saying and sort of translate for him. Mm -hmm. So he's, and he's everything. 
um, that he's depicted in the book of every man. And um, he isn't perfect, but he, and he's got a strange view of what's going on. He's got a kind of an innocent view. And uh, sometimes they're on top of his, you know, his game, and other times he's not. And, um, but uh, it's almost as though the cast of characters creates the, um, the questions and the imperfections and everything else. But they're self-correcting, and they sort of fulfill that need to be every man interacting with every other man. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Sure, yeah. Is there a question there? No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't. Know, I don't know what to say. That I mean. I guess that uh, like dialogue is a really good way of bringing scenes to life and uh, making characters feel real, and also explaining things. If you're careful, you can get. You can explain situations, which this banking book. So much to be explained, um, and so I try to have the characters do it via, via um, in conversation. Um, the, the difficulty of that book was because they're bankers. They're all just, you know, they're, they're, just, they're monomaniacs. Like, all they care about is, is money. Um, and I did so much research on the book, and I read so many books about banking. And the bankers, I don't know if there's any bankers here. Of course not. Um, but, uh, but the bankers were so unpleasant. They were just such awful people. I read a book about Goldman Sachs, a book about um, Bear Stearns, a book about, what's the other one? I can't remember. Lehman Brothers. And the bankers were just so repulsive that I had to, like, I had to change them. I had to, like, make them significantly nicer than they were in real life. Because otherwise, they seemed like they, they to your point again, like, they, they, they seemed unreal. Like, if you write them down as, as they were, they seemed like, like monsters. So you had to actually change them and make them nicer uh, in order for them just to register as, as, as real. <laughs> so, and then we're going to, Suzanne Matson, another novelist in the audience, if you want to comment on this, but we're going to, we'll, um, we'll give the mic to Tom for a Paul, thank you for being here. Um, wondering, seven years between novels, what do you do with the rest of your life? Uh, oh, I'm working, working all the time. Like, that's, that's, they just take a long time, you know? That's, that's simple as that. But, I mean, you've got to have income. Pardon me? You have enough royalties from your first book? Oh, God, no. Um... <laughs> Uh, no, well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I couldn't do it here. I couldn't do it in America because I couldn't afford to. Uh, I couldn't afford. To, I just couldn't afford it. Like it's just, it's like health insurance is too expensive. Education is too expensive. Um, in Ireland, um, schools are free. My son's school is free, uh, and it's a good. There's none of this districting stuff. Like it's so. It's just like a school. It's a good school. Um, Healthcare is free. It's not always very good healthcare, but it's free. You won't like die in a, on the side of the street. Um, there's a pension when you get old. Uh, there's uh, an arts council, so they will they'll kind of give you grants to to write your book. You have to apply, but they'll give you like a grant, which is like not enormous, but it'll pay for sort of six months of writing. Um, and I do scripts like you know this script was like was that I, I talked about was atypical. Like other scripts have been sort of more fun to work on, and that's lucrative. Like there's lots of there's lots of things that will sort of like pay the way like a little bit um, and keep you rolling for a little while longer. Uh, and but it, it's always just like the skin of your teeth. You know, you got to finish by the skin of your teeth. Like oh my god, <laughs> I better get this book handed in or else you know we're gonna have we're gonna have issues. But uh, but I'm feel lucky that I live in Ireland. There's lots of terrible things um, about living in Ireland. Uh, but uh, for a writer, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's viable in a way that it wouldn't be in the US. And I think in the US, uh, just from being here in the last couple of months, um, I don't think I understood this. I, didn't, I don't think I understood how lucky I am. Um, I don't think I understood how difficult it would be for me to to do the same job here. I just, I just don't know how I would do it. <laughs>